Welcome to Bible class at the Granbury Church of Christ. I really appreciate your presence this morning as we continue to read through uh, the pastoral epistles. And as you well know, we're still in 1 Timothy. It's a great opportunity for us to, uh, to study together this, this good Lord's Day morning. If you will, let's continue to use 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16 as a way of, uh, of kind of anchoring ourselves in this text. So if you will, wherever you are, please read with me. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is kind of our point of orientation for reading 1 Timothy, because Paul states himself, I'm writing these things for this purpose, as we'll know how to behave in the household of God. So as we get into chapter 5 in this lesson, I pray that we'll, we'll read it and we'll, we'll interpret it and apply it in view of what Paul's concern is for the entire letter. If you will, pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we praise your name on this first day of the week. Let all glory be given to you, for you alone are worthy. We pray, Father, that you'll be with your people worldwide this day, as some have already assembled and some are yet to assemble. We pray that you will be with all those who are leading the gatherings of Christians, that what is done will be of glory and honor to your name, and what is done will be of benefit to the health and strength of every congregation, of every gathering. We pray, Father, also that you'll be with those who preach your word this day. We ask that you fill them with the truth and with the fire of your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the mission of the Holy Spirit to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I pray, Father, it will work mightily in all places of earthly power, that a spiritual revival of all that is true will sweep throughout not only our land but around the world. Father, we thank you for giving us this day what we need for life, both physical life and spiritual life. And as we gather around the Lord's table this day, Father, I pray that we will uh, we will truly honor the remembrance of, of our Savior. We'll truly honor our Savior in remembering what He has done and proclaiming what He has done until He comes. We're especially grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to do that this day. Father, despite our fears and failures, and we know there are times when we can be overwhelmed with our fears and failures, I pray, Lord, that uh, we'll look to you for protection and for health, help and for salvation. Father, we confess that uh, many of the things that we've done in, before you are, are wrong or are, are, are a sin against you, that we have, like the prodigal said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And uh, I pray, Father, that you will forgive us of our sins and look at us through your, your kind and tender mercy that we'll be saved from our sins. Thank you, Father, so much for the hope that we have in Jesus and that we can pray to you in this manner. Father, once again, we ask your guidance, your presence as we continue to read this letter that has so many things in it that are so relevant to what we're doing and what we want to do in our world today. Thank you, God, for blessing us with the opportunity to study your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, looking back at 1 Timothy 4, uh, it started with a warning. Uh, Paul warned that some would depart the faith, that they would get involved in the teachings of demons and impress those things on churches. And uh, he gave a couple of examples of teachings of demons, that is forbidding marriage and requiring abstinence from food. In other words, uh, a very ascetic life in regard to those two 
characteristics and of course that sort of thing can also lead to, to more things like it and Paul was saying that's not the way to spirituality because he gives a quick correction to the um, um, false teaching that he that he identified there and that quick correction is that everything created by God is good and it is to be received with thanksgiving and so both blessing uh, or rather both marriage and food are, are and, and God's provision of what we need for physical life both of those things are rooted in the Garden of Eden story so go back to the very beginning and you find the correction for the false teaching that's beginning to uh, influence and affect the church in, in Timothy's day and so uh, we, we, we receive those things and we receive those things with thanksgiving and then after that quick correction uh, Paul follows it up with instructions to a minister that is Timothy to continue teaching and exampling now I know exampling is not a word uh, but I've made it up and it really that's what Timothy is called to be he's called to be an example of the teaching that he's giving and he's to train himself in godliness so that other people will see what godliness looks like and live a godly life we, we kind of review you can one way you can review first Timothy 4 is look at the the commands that he gives Timothy train yourself command and teach devote yourself do not neglect, practice, immerse, that is in, just completely uh, overwhelm yourself, uh, baptize yourself, so to speak, in all of these things that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, not only the content of the teaching, but the doing of the teaching. Keep close watch on yourself, persist in these things. And then I, I think another thing that ought to be probably mentioned is let no one despise you for your youth. Paul is very aware that he sent Timothy into a congregation of older believers, at least some of whom, and I would expect quite a few of whom, were older than he than he was. And so Paul said, said the, the way to, to avoid people looking down on your youth is just to be a good example. Set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. And really, no matter what where we are, Paul is. We'll say we'll see in, in chapter five divides the church into older men, older women, younger men, younger women. Wherever you find yourself in those categories, uh, there's no reason for anybody to look down on you in any of those categories, as you set an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And so. We come into chapter 5, looking back at the purpose of the letter, that is how, how we ought to behave. And now in chapter 5, Paul is going to speak to some specific groups and to some specific problems that he knew about that were going on in the churches in Ephesus. And, and this really becomes a good challenge for us. It's a good exercise in interpretation and application, asking the question, how do these solutions to first century church problems speak to our 21st century congregation? And I would hope that what we do is uh, bridge from that first century context to our context by looking for the spirit of what Paul is calling for here, by looking at uh, the principles that are involved, and not necessarily, not, not, well, I would say not in any way being legalistic about it, uh, and and uh, we'll see here in a minute. Paul lays down some some rather uh, clear uh, uh, requirements for dealing with a problem in the church in Ephesus, and and we have to kind of take those and apply them to to our situation. We we'll, I'll I'll say more about that in just a minute as we get into the first problem that he brings up. One of the things that's also working in the background is the community perception of the church. Uh, the gospel is in a context of being criticized probably. Uh, Paul's very aware of, of how uh, there's going to be some increasing persecution from various authorities that, that are, are present in their ancient world and so 
He's concerned about the community perception of the church, not that we should ever be driven by community perception, nor should we be motivated by community perception, but we need to be aware of it. For example, and he really, he really speaks about this in terms of the overseers of the church. Uh, the overseer must be one who is well thought of by outsiders living a life without reproach. That is, you can make accusations against them, but the accusations are not going to hold uh, any water at all once they are investigated. So the, the point of all of this, we'll, we'll read this one again, but in 514, you don't want to give the adversary any opportunity for slander. And so throughout, uh, especially as he speaks about the leadership of the church, working in, this back, in the background is Paul's concern about the community perception and how that will uh, either contribute to a reception of the gospel or contribute to a rejection of the gospel. That's kind of the point in all of this. So let's begin reading 1 Timothy chapter 5. 5.1, 5, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. And so that general statement of set an example for believers is now applied to four specific groups. And essentially Paul is instructing to is instructing Timothy to set his, uh, to, to behave as the church where your family, which in fact they are. And there are two principles for, uh, that Jesus gives here that are at uh, work. And that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And uh, also I think at work here is the principle of Jesus which says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And so with a servant kind of attitude, you're going to relate to the four different congregation, uh, four different groups of, the, uh, of these divisions of the congregation in this way. And so I'd, I would wonder, what if, what if for the next couple of weeks I would really keep these instructions in mind and, uh, and, and treat as father, as mother, as brother, as sister. That, 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 that really speaks to all of us, not just Timothy, but it speaks to all of us. And so as we go into now a specific problem in the letter, let's read 5, 3 and following. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow left all alone has her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command and teach these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, first of all, the context in which we find these instructions given is in a world without any form of state organized social welfare, which, you know, that's different in our context. Our context has social security and other forms of social welfare that typically kick in in terms of, of, uh, of how a, a person in, in the circumstances that are described here in chapter 5 uh, go. And, and, and yet, despite all of that, the church must distinguish itself in behaving as a family and looking out for the needs of the folks involved. But apparently that was that kind of behavior of the church that kind of expectation of the church was also being used as an opportunity for abuse. And apparently that's why this comes up in the church in Ephesus, that in some way there were family members who were not taking care of, their widows, uh, of the widows in their families, but they were expecting the church to do it. And so we kind of have to walk, kind of, we have, we have to use wisdom in walking through this. Uh, what is a family called to do? What, is a fam what should a family be doing? On the other hand, in a sense, where you come out at the conclusion of all this, what is the church supposed to do? How, how are 
how are, are, what is the church's response to all this? And one of the things we ought to remember is that what, what Paul, the kind of problem that Paul is talking about here is something that has a rich Old Testament history in terms of, uh, of, of God and, and the character of God, the nature of God, the desire of God. Let's read Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 18. Not reading all the verse, but uh, the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords who executes justice for the orphan and the widow. And then every third year you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The orphans and the widows in your towns may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you and undertake. And then when you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, don't go back and get it. Just leave it. Leave it for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. And so this and there are many, many other Old Testament passages that speak of God's concern for the orphan and the widow and then how he expects his people to join him in that concern and behave in some particular ways that will provide for their needs. And so if a widow has children or grandchildren, then they need to step up. They need, it's, it's interesting here how Paul describes their response. It is a godly response. Here is an opportunity for them to demonstrate godliness. And then in fact, he goes ahead and says, if they don't, they've denied the faith. They are worse than an unbeliever. Uh, it's pretty strong language here that Paul uh, applies to those who refuse to do what they are, are, are willing and able to do. However, though we call for families to be responsible, there are times at some point where the church is responsible and, and needs to step in and must step in in order that the needs of the, of the widow would be provided. And so Paul continues. He says, let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation of good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. First of all, what he says here suggests that there was a formal process in the church, a formal process of, of examining the situation, examining the needs of the, per, of, of the widow involved, uh, seeing how the family is is either responding or not responding, uh, seeing what resources she has, and then and then enrolling her in 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 a way of approving that yes, the church is going to step in and help. And then he gives a list of qualifications. Now this is the fourth list of specific qualifications applied to a person or a group of people in 1 Timothy. First of all, qualification for overseer, then qualifications for deacons, and then qualifications for either deacons' wives or, or female servants of the church, deaconesses, if you will. Uh, however you choose to, to interpret that, however we interpret that, I guess probably we should say. And then now he, we have another list of qualifications. First of all, 60 years of age. And so he, he asked, he chooses kind of an arbitrary point that de, going to, to determine whether she's a young widow or an, an elderly widow, uh, one who is truly a widow. And uh, that's what I, I meant, I kind of alluded to a while ago in terms of what if she's 59 and a half and the need exists? Well, it would seem to me you step in. It, it's, 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 Paul, it, we need to, what is the spirit of what's going on here. And if she's a younger woman, then a younger widow, then Paul has some other advice. We're gonna read that in just a minute. For her, this is what he recommends, how the church should respond. But for the ones who are, who are going to meet the qualifications of this formal kind of enrollment, first of all, 60 years of age, wife of one husband, I think what that means is she's been faithful to her husband. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's only had one husband because Paul goes ahead 
and recommends that uh, the younger widows, widows be married. So, so they would have a second husband. And what if after, what if he passes away when they're 61 and a half years old and then they're left without? So you see, uh, probably he, what, what the meaning here is that she's, she's been faithful to her husband. She has a reputation of good works and raised children. What does this sound like? Well, it sounds like elders and, and deacons, doesn't it? It sounds like the same sorts of things that, that Paul expected of them, he's also expecting of, of the widows with a bit more uh, of a specific job description, shown hospitality, uh, washed the, the saints' feet, cared for the afflicted, devoted to every good work. Uh, so we have here, First of all, and I would, go, going back to the, so th that list of characteristics that we see right there is also prefaced by what Paul said uh, earlier, and that she's truly a widow, left all alone. There are no family members, no, no one who, who, except the church, who can step in and help her. And she also has her hope set on God. Well, you look at most of what's said here, and that's truly, ex um, expressive of a life that has a life whose hope has been set on God. It continues in supplications and prayers night and day. She's not self-indulgent. And I think this self-indulgent uh, word here, that, that's in contrast to the younger widow who Paul pretty much assumes is going to be self-indulgent. I think it's kind of interesting uh, as we look back at uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke, that Luke told us about Anna, the prophetess, who came up to, to Mary and Joseph when they had Jesus in the temple for his circumcision. Uh, dedication, there, Anna the prophetess, who said this, uh, the, 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 she was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple to serve God with fasting and praying night and day. That's the kind of person you, you have kind of in picture here as Paul paints a picture of those who should be enrolled and should receive the support from the congregation. So let's think about this. Uh, she's really a person of significant influence. And that's not typically how we would think of a widow, certainly not just in, in general society. Uh, we're we're going to think of a per, of a widow as as one without much influence, and there are parts of Scripture. Uh, a widow without influence has to go to the judge daily, night and day, pleading her cause until finally he says yes, just so that that she'll not come uh, to his office the next day because she's not a person of of very much influence. But but here Paul speaks of a person that what you would see has. Uh, a lot of influence in the church in terms of being a living expression of the presence of Christ. And, and in a way, what he describes here is, is a person with a ministry, potentially as significant or even more significant in some ways as that of any overseer. And, and really, you remember, I was kind of the summary statement that I'd made about the qualifications for the overseer in 1 Timothy 3. And that is Paul essentially is talking about a person who is in control of himself and his resources. And, and that's what he's describing here. He's describing a woman who is fully in control of herself and her resources. And those kind of folk are worthy of, of support from the congregation. And we'll see that what, what he is expecting the church to do for widows like this, he's also going to expect uh, the church to do for certain overseers. But there's more to be said, as, and, and apparently this was, was a real problem in the church in Ephesus because Paul has, note, note how much uh, space in a brief letter he gives to uh, helping Timothy solve this problem but refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Rather a puzzling sort of statement. The only thing I can think of is that uh, she's going to marry an unbeliever and thus fall away from her commitment to Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't know beyond that, but it's, it is a, a puzzling kind of thing 
and I'll have a word to say that, about that in just a second, again, in terms of how we probably ought to hear all of this. Let me go ahead and read. Besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, which now, so he encourages them to marry. I, I wonder uh, how that kind of matches up. Paul doesn't give us an explanation. How does that match up with their desire to marry and how it could incur condemnation? Nevertheless, I would say from 1 Corinthians, and though you can't make all of this quite match what he says in 1 Corinthians 7, certainly from 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is expecting the younger widow to marry a Christian. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing. It, it, it is a woman's responsibility to respond to this need. Uh, I'm assuming that she's a married woman. Uh, is he talking about a widow woman who, who is going to do this? I, I, I would think not, given the context. but. Kind of a, uh, one of the things he's driving at, and it would seem to me that's the underlying assumption we have to make, is that this was becoming a real problem in the church in Ephesus. And so Paul is essentially giving some very specific instructions so that the church would not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Well, Paul has some very strong assumptions about younger widows. Or maybe I should say not assumptions, but experiences. That is, he's able to say some have already strayed. And so based on our experience here, here's what we need to do. And let me give you these instructions that you'd follow through that everything that happens here is something that get, is, is a reason for us to thank God and give glory to God, that there's no occasion for slander from our ad from any adversary here, essentially from Satan, that, 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 that Satan is get not given an occasion, an opportunity to bring slander to the church. Well, from, from resolving that kind of difficulty in the church in Ephesus, now Paul is going to speak to problems that arise according uh, uh, concerning various overseers. But now, notice he is calling the overseer an elder. Uh, some would say that he's talking about two different groups of people. I, I would say, based on 1, Corinthians, or 1 Peter 5, he's talking about the same person. But in, in, in the New Testament church, what, what we have are, are elders who are described as overseers, who are described as pastors, or overseers who are described as elders and as pastors, that those three words define and describe a specific role in the congregation, the role of leadership in the congregation. So let elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and in teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. It would have been nice to, if Paul had, had kind of given us a little, a little fuller definition of double honor. Now, he's given us a definition of at least part of it. Certainly, when he said double honor, he's talking about financial support. Financial support is the meaning because of the texts that he calls upon. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And actually words from Jesus, the laborer deserves his wages. And so, so in the first century church and going on beyond the first century, there would be, be overseers, elders, pastors, who were then supported by the congregation. And Paul says, especially those whose, whose primary responsibility is preaching and teaching. But it would seem to me that in terms of double honor, 
there's it's not it's not just financial help but we're going to honor them for what they do we're going to thank them we're going to uh, we're going to give them respect we're going to treat them in a, in a good way so uh, I, I would initially enter into commentary on this text by just asking the question are we a congregation where elders are a target of criticism or a or are they a target of care where elders are a target of criticism or a target of care do we give them double honor in that regard well sometimes it doesn't go well sometimes there is an elder who must be confronted for his behavior and so do, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses as for those who persist in sin rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear for elders who can't manage themselves for elders who for whatever reason get out of line then you have to respond something has to be done remember the unity of the congregation is probably at stake remember the reputation of the congregation and the community is at stake and things are going to happen wherever a group of people work together conflicts are going to occur the church and its leaders are never going to be perfect we are not exempt from sin from fault from mistakes but sometimes when that criticism arises, those who receive it must be very careful. Uh, be careful so that you don't receive every criticism and immediately act on it. Seek out more than one witness in this regard. Just because someone has been criticized doesn't mean that they are automatically guilty. And so there has to be a thorough investigation of what, what the, the criticism or accusation is about. And, and, and the, the leaders involved definitely need to have that kind of respect and confidence from the congregation. But on the other hand, if, if it is found true, then here's what, what must, the, the, they, must be, they must be disciplined they must receive the discipline of the congregation in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. You know, I don't think, I, I don't, I can't remember any time. I, I, know, I can remember some times when elders were approached privately, never, never to the point of that being a public matter. Uh, that's a difficult time for the church. But listen to, to Paul as he speaks of how important careful obedience to these instructions really are to the health and the future of the congregation. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands or take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Well, what I really wanted to emphasize here was that statement in the presence of God, in the presence of Christ Jesus, all heaven is watching. And so in view of the witness of all of heaven, then carefully carry out these rules, these instructions. This is a phrase that communicates the importance of the instruction. But not only is, is, is heaven watching, but heaven is also supporting you. Heaven is affirming you. Heaven is behind you. So with heaven as your witness, do not waver in these instructions. One of the best ways to avoid the unpleasant experience of having to go through some kind of investigation and public 
that, that is going to lead to a public rebuke. One of the best ways to avoid that is don't be quick. Don't, and, and this would go back to 1 Timothy 3, back to chapter 3 when, when Paul said, don't choose an overseer who is a recent convert. Because, because the role of, of, of being an overseer in the church may go to his head, may go to his pride, give Satan an opportunity to step in and exploit all of that. And so one of the best ways to avoid that sort of unpleasant experience is not to be hasty. Don't quickly lay hands on, on, uh, on one who is not qualified or about whom there is any any doubt regarding his qualification to serve in the role of overseer elder. This laying out of hands was their public way of recognizing and authorizing a man to serve as an overseer or an elder in the congregation. And what Paul is, is also implying here that for us to participate in that kind of public action also means that we bear some responsibility for the results uh, that occur. And, uh, and so he's saying, take care, Timothy. There's the implication that you, as, uh, you may bear some responsibility for what happens as a result of this. It's also interesting to me that t it seems like Timothy, in the role of evangelist, as we typically describe his role, as we talk about the pastoral epistles, talking about both Titus and Timothy, we his his uh, he he's he takes the leading role in 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 doing these things, the leading role in ordination, the leading role in uh, in the investigation, which typically that's not true. We mm -hmm. we typically don't do that in our day and time. We would expect the elders to uh, to to take care of themselves in these sorts of matters. So I don't know. I'll, I'll let you sort that all out. <laughs> That'd be a good good place for us to sit down and have a discussion about this, but. Part of Paul's warning here is that he doesn't want Timothy taking part in the sins of others. And that's why, uh, for one thing, Tim Timothy can't ignore these problems that are going on because that's just a way to participate in the sin. And then that little suggestion about uh, drink some wine, it's a real challenge, isn't it, for a movement with a public stance against drinking any kind of alcohol, oh, it's actually our, our, our uh, emphasis on, on that's changed. I had a, on, on our recent visit uh, that Calvin Warpula and I had with Dino and Mata Genetos, this, this whole matter of wine drinking came up. And they pointed out how different it is in Greece. In Greece, there's no alcoholism because it's how people drink. They drink wine with with food with a meal, and and that seems to make a difference. I, I'm not, but there's just something about the American culture and character that uh, we have to respond to this. It seems to me a little bit differently, and I know there's a lot more to this, and I don't have time to go in to all of this. So I'll, I'll let you work on that, but one of the things probably that I do notice in all this is Paul is really trying. He's doing everything he can to take care of his son in the faith. He wants Timothy to do well, and so he's giving him the very best instructions he knows how so that he will do well. And then Paul speaks of the sins of some people, and so kind of a summary statement for all that's been said, especially regarding uh, overseers who are, who, are, who are doing some things that ought not to be done. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. The sins of others appear later. So also, so and this is probably the part of this that we ought to hear. I, I, Sometimes we may be more inclined to, to hear about this matter of, of sin and judgment. But, but good works are conspicuous. Even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So there's some things that are really evident and yet there's some things that are hidden. 
And it's kind of interesting that sin and good works, two opposite sorts of things, sin and good works, share in this commonality. Both can be evident, both can be hidden, but the point is, both will eventually be revealed. Both of those things will be going before us into judgment. It, it may be hidden from men, but it's not hidden from God. God is not fooled. God is, is not blind. And so here you have both a warning based in reality and, a, a, an, a, a, an exhortation also based in reality. Uh, it, 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 may, it makes me think of what Jesus said when he said in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so where, where there are times when, when because of the sin that especially if it, if it is made public, it becomes something really discouraging and weighs us down. Wait a minute, there's a way to respond to that. And that response is going to be the response of good works. And then the final group in this section, and actually there's at least one more grouping that occurs in, in chapter 6, but now we're into chapter 6, but this piece of, of chapter 6 really fits with what started at uh, chapter 5, verse, verse 1. So he's talked about the widows, both older widows who are truly widows and younger widows. He's talked about overseers, and uh, he, now he's talking about slaves. Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. I make note here that bond servants in, in the English Standard Version, which could actually refer more to people who, because they were in servitude as slaves because of just indebtedness to, who, to, to uh, the person who, who held the debt. So that's kind of the sense of bond servants. But he's also, the word is slaves people who have been captured in war or in some other way and now they are they're just they've just become property and in the roman culture of paul's day slavery was a deeply rooted institution very widespread there are estimates of up to 50 percent population of the roman empire at that time were slaves they conducted the most basic functions of society menial tasks, but not, not just menial tasks. Many slaves were estate managers. They, they also functioned as teachers in, in their society. Nevertheless, they were basically considered tools. They were sort of the technology of their day. And, uh, and they, they were a part of the, of the essential, uh, they were an essential part to the economic functioning of the empire. So it, it puzzles us. Paul doesn't say let them go at all. He doesn't say release them. But what he does do is he plants a seed that will eventually mean for Christian people that slavery should not ever be practiced. There was a great gulf between the slave and the slave owner. And yet, when, when both of them became a Christian, or even just one of them became a Christian, there was a bridge that was then built over that gulf. And here he speaks just to, uh, to the slaves. We know that in Ephesians and Colossians, he speaks to both slaves and masters. But the slave must not be disrespectful. But because you're a Christian, and here the assumption He's speaking to slaves in Christian households. But because you're a Christian, then you serve your Christian master all the, the, all the, all the better. And here, the, the, I mean, this is for, for Paul's day and time to speak of believers and beloved when you talk of slave and master. 
was a very radical matter. Your slave is your brother in Christ. Your believing master is your brother in Christ. You are first of all Christians. And so in, in this way, the seed for the elimination of slavery was sown in the Roman Empire. And, and so that the name of God, we heard that phrase in that reading. Again, it's, it, the matter is so that the teaching may not be reviled, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled was the phrase that we read in there. And I, I think uh, we don't have time for this, but one of the places to go in the, the rest of the New Testament is, is to look at the story uh, of Philemon and Onesimus and what occurs there. The radical transformation that happens because of confessing that Jesus is Lord in this relationship is well, well described there. So the ground for Paul's concerns flows from his view of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, and the world. Paul is, knows that he's speaking to the renewed family of God, which is the pillar and support of the truth. And on the basis of that, then Paul is going to, uh, is, is going to call for these kinds of actions to the problems that he's either inferred or described in the church in Ephesus. Uh, I want to move on through several theological perspectives and just get on. Uh, time is, is, is finished for our class today, and I really appreciate your presence. Uh, next week, we'll finish the reading of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 21, under the title of What Do We Really Want? I hope you'll be present for that. That's kind of a curious title for that chapter, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to what I'm going to say about that. So what do we really want? And I hope you'll be present. Let's uh, read together, if you will, read together this benediction, and I will lead us in prayer. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, we're so thankful this morning for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for your love. We're thankful, Father, that we have opportunity to be in fellowship with your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that as a congregation, when we approach the various problems that we encounter, we encounter them with grace and love and the fellowship of the Spirit. And I pray, Father, that though our problems may not quite match what we read this morning in 1 Timothy 5, I pray that the principles, the concern, the desire, the desire that you have for your name and your message and your gospel to be well received in this world, I pray, Father, that... Uh, that we'll pay attention to all of that. And I also pray, Lord, that even when we're not well received, that we won't give up, that we won't quit, but that we will continue to be faithful to your word in every way, faithful to you in every way. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity for us to share together these words from your, your holy scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless.